All right, I'm going to go over chapters 45 and 46. Just looking around here, and first of all, we're, we're light on people. Second of all, some of the people who are here look to me like they're more out of it than they are with it. So I'm going to go over both chapters, um, and they talk about SQ light. And then on Thursday, I am going to go and lecture, but I'll try to keep it down to an hour, and I'll talk about core data. All right? So what I'll do is, again, I'm not going to repeat any of the stuff I said in the last lecture. That's all out there already. So, again, I don't think that we have to talk about what SQLite is, et cetera. You've already seen that stuff, so I don't think that's really very important. Uh, you know, know what SQL is. Now, then they talk here on, so I am going to show you this trying SQLite on a Mac just so you can see what it is, okay? So... Again, what you have to do, and I've got instructions for this out there also, but you go into Finder, and under Finder in here, under Applications, all right, so under Applications, you go all the way down right near the bottom. At the bottom is Xcode, and right up above Xcode is Utilities. So I'm going to click on Utilities. I get my little swirly thing. Well, you don't get it, but I get it. So this comes up, and one of the things that's under here is terminal. Everybody see that? So where it says terminal, that literally is the equivalent of like doing CMD in Windows world, where you get a DOS prompt. All right, but here it's, a, of course, it'd be a Mac prompt. Okay? So again, once I do that and it comes up like this, then to start SQL Lite, I just say SQLite 3. Space, whoops, I gotta spell it right. SQLite 3 space, all right, dot slash, and what they had in the book was my database dot db. Okay, and I'm in. You can see how that changed and it showed me. Now, I've already created the contacts table that's shown in the book. If I wanna know what tables I have, I can just say dot tables. Well, I, maybe it, it would, I can recreate it. That's cool. It must have only saved it for the last session. I don't know why, but it, it must have. So I can come in here now, and I can start to create the table. So it's a little bit different, but it's virtually the same. So I want to say here, uh, I, since I don't have a table yet, I have to create one first. So create table contacts. All right. Here I don't need the underscore, so it's just ID integer, primary key, okay, and then, uh, whoops, an auto increment, and then they also put in here name, which was text, address, which was text, and phone, which is text. Okay, and when it comes back and you just get like this, all, you've got all these instructions. You don't have to write this down. Just like I did with the other class, I made a list of instructions. Every single thing I'm doing right now. All right. So now we can go in there, and now when I say dot tables, you'll notice it says contacts. It's there. So now I can come in and insert into contacts values. Whoops, I think I think I need the field names. Uh, what is it? Name, uh, address, phone, values, and again, this I'm just going to show it the way they put it in the book, which was Bill Smith, 123 Main Street, California, and then the phone number that they put in was 123-555-2323. Again, you see I get the prompt back, meaning that it worked just fine. You can use, I can't call it DOS key because this isn't DOS, but I can use my up arrow to bring back what I just had so I can just change what I need to change here. All right, and this guy, this was... Uh, <clears throat> For the second one, it was Mike Parks, and he was on uh, 10 
Upping Street. It's Upping, Upping or Upper, Upping Street in Idaho. And his phone number was 444-444-1212. So now that's in there. So now if I say select star from contacts, you see there they are. Okay, that should be no surprise. Okay, and this is what they show in the book on uh, the beginning of chapter 45, okay, which is on page 321, and this is what they show on 322. So again, there's nothing in there that should be a surprise to anyone. If I had done this in the last... Uh, class, that's exactly what it would have looked like in there. So this is, again, what's in the book on 320, 321, and 322. If I want to get out now and, and just leave here, I say dot .exit, okay, and you may or may not be able to tell, but I'm out of SQL Lite now. If I type in exit again, okay, now it's logging out and boom, okay, and it says it's completed, so I can just click right here, and now it's gone. Okay? But if I wanted to practice with a database, this is a way that I could do it. Okay? So that's the first thing that they talk about in here. Again, that's the trying SQLite thing that's on section 45.3. So I just went ran over all that stuff with you. So I'm going to jump up to section 45.4 which is near the bottom or the middle of page 323. It says, preparing an iOS application for SQLite integration. We don't have the seamless way that we did this in Android land. And not only that, it's, it's worse than that. And the reason I'm saying it's worse than that is there's stuff in the book that's wrong. And when I say that it's wrong, what it is is changes have been made since this book was written to some of the stuff that's in the book. So I will show you when we get to that point, because it's at the beginning of the next chapter, where there's a problem, what those problems are. All right? Now, in the last class, I went in there and I showed you in here. I didn't really go through these, but again, there was the cursor class. Uh, there was the SQLite database class. There was the SQLite Open Helper class, and there was the Content Values class. Now, it's not exactly like that in what we'll call iOS land. And again, if you look up on the screen here, now I can exit from here. All right, if you look up on the screen here, well, you can't because I don't have that screen up there. But on the P drive, for the, you know, just like we did before, I've, I've got a thing in the in-class folder for the 152, 153 under the in-class folder. There's one in there with today's date on it. What is in there, just so you know, there are four things in there. The database project that's created in the next chapter, chapter 46, the complete project is in there. That's the first thing. The second thing are all those steps that I just showed you to get into and out of working in terminal. All right, so it's just a simple text file. Then there's another thing that's in there, what the author of this book decided to do, again, whether it's good, bad, indifferent, right or wrong, was he said that, that it really, if, if you want to use straight C programming, and you know what C is, but if you want to use straight C programming in here, it's a pain. Because C is a non-object-oriented language, and this is object-oriented. All right, so there's a lot of work you have to do to make it work. So just like in the last chapter, what, what we have to do here is we have to literally bring in an SQLite wrapper. And the one that the author suggests that you bring in is something that's called FM Database. And the reason that he suggests that you, that you bring an FM database, and he gives you all the steps, we'll look at it in just a second. But the reason that he, he recommends that you use FM database is it's been around for quite a while. It's very stable. 
it works very well. It was actually a wrapper that was created, and it was created for Objective-C, but it works very well also um, with Swift. Okay, so the, the class reference and the stuff that's in there, I, I save that for you also. Plus, I saved for you an article that I found out on brianjcoleman.com. Who is Brian J. Coleman? I don't have a clue. But he's got an article out there on the web that's called Framework, Using FMDB to Communicate with SQLite Databases. And he shows you the way that he does it in there as far as being able to add things and then creating a table, retrieving data from a table, and inserting data into a table, and updating a record in a table. Finally, deleting a record in a table. Now, the way that he shows it isn't exactly the way that the author of our book shows it. So why would I put that out there? To show you that, as always, there's more than one way of doing the same thing. All right? And the way that this Brian Coleman does it in that article, if you take the time to read it, is he writes code that is much more objective C. All right? It's much more objective C than it is um, swift looking, okay? Now, do you have to care about that? No, but I just wanted you to know there's more than one way of doing it, that's all. So again, he tries to sell you in section 45.5 on the bottom of page 323. This is why we were, are going to use this FMDB wrapper. All right, and then going on to the, the bottom of that page, and here at the top of the next page, again, I gave you this FMDB class reference. So you have all these. these this very little bit of stuff that he put right here, this very, he got that almost directly from right here. All right, and if you look, a lot of the stuff that's out here is out on GitHub. All right, more and more stuff is being put up there for GitHub. In fact, one of the things that we're going to do, not in this class, but in the DIP class, I'm working right now to, to try to teach myself some Angular. And when we work with that, there's even a simpler way of doing Angular than even using XAMPP. All right? And it's using, you may have heard, heard this name, you may not have, but there's, there's a, a thing out there that allows you to, to create very simple apps. It's called Plunker. And it's, it's, an, it's neat because even though it's called Plunker, there are no vowels in it. It's P-L-N-K-R. It's Plunker, all right? The reason I'm telling you that is it, when you go and you, you, you create files and you save them, if you want to save them, you need a GitHub account, all right? So I'm going to recommend that when we go through this, that everybody sign up. It's free. They don't spam you or anything for your own GitHub account, all right? And the only reason I'm telling you that is a lot of the stuff that you're going to find as you get into more and more stuff that's technical is out there. GitHub is a really good open source repository. All right. So the rest of this chapter, where he talks about creating and opening a database, all right, if you notice here, and again, this is, if you're following along in the book, this is near the top of page 324 in the book, okay? So this should make sense. If you're going to work with a database, you first have to create the database and you have to open it. We've done that before now in many different languages. So as the author says, the following code opens the database file at the path that's specified. All right? And it may or may not look difficult, but it really isn't that hard. Because what you're doing here is you're specifying the connection, basically. And then you're saying, if it's equal nil, what does that mean? That means that either you try to connect to a database that isn't there, or you try to create a database and you don't have permissions to do so, or you try to create a database and, and the, the disk is full or whatever. There's a problem. So if you try to do this and you try to make that database connection and it comes back as nil, that was a problem. All right? So otherwise, you come in and you try to open it. Uh, again, you'd only open, you, do, you have to open it, I should say, before you start working on it. Whether that means that you're going to come in there and create a table in it, or you're going to start working with it, or whatever. 
Again, these are the same types of steps that we went through last semester in the PHP class. All right, hopefully you remember that. So next, on the bottom or middle of page five or 324, he talks about creating a database table. <clears throat> and as he says, he talks about what tables are, but the point is, well, look at this. That's virtually, that's the same thing I just typed in when I showed it to you from terminal. The only difference is in here, this says create table if not exists. So if you could put checks in there. Maybe you've done that before with like a database. Create database if not exists. All right. Because if you create a database and you put in there if not exists, all right, what that's saying is come back and give me a warning if it already something by that name already does exist. Okay? And then after you've done that, so this is basically this is the SQL, and then it's execute statements. And you're telling it to execute that statement that you just created. And if for some reason it returns false, you had an error. So again, with all these, what you're going to notice when we go through them and you look at the actual code is we just print out the latest error that came out. Okay? And it's, it, when we're doing this, we're not putting it in the try-catch or anything. But really, I mean, if you can't open up a database, it, depending on the severity that is in the app, but most of the time, you want to get the heck out. You want to print an error and you want to get out because you can't do anything. All right? So he mentions that, and then on the very bottom of the page on 324, and it goes up to the top of the next page, he talks about extracting data. And I do want to mention this. It's really important that you look at this. Because what you're going to see when you start doing the stuff that's in here <clears throat> and you want to extract data, what you're going to notice is at least at times when you start doing this, I guess we don't see it in this example, but you will in a later one, that the question mark and the uh, exclamation point are going to come into play. Because what if you put it in there, what they, what they do in this particular, we'll see it in the next chapter, this is going to be the interface. All right, it's going to look like this. Name, address, I think it's name, address, and phone. And phone. I put colons there, but you didn't have to. All right, then they've got a thing here. This is just a label. In fact, they want you to make it basically like this. I didn't do any auto layout, so I ran it. I have no idea how it looks if you, uh, if you run it in landscape. It might look terrible. I never did any checking or anything on that. So the, and then here there's a button that says save, and here there's a button that says find, all right? So looking at what we just did in that contacts table, if you remember, we put in here Bill Smith, address was 123 Main Street, and that was California, and the phone number, well, I don't remember what it was, but let's say 555-555. Five, 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 one, two, one, two. So if you put all that stuff in and you click save and it works, what happens in this line right here is it comes up and it says record saved. Okay? Then everything that's in here clears out. And it's also set up with find, I don't remember if it's name or address, but I think it's name, that you can put a name in there. You click find and it fills in the rest of the fields for you. And if, so let's say that I put this in and our author's name is Smythe, if you remember that, and there is no Bill Smythe in there. So if I put that in and I click find, it comes up in here and it says record not found. That makes sense? It's virtually identical to the one that we looked at before, but the one we looked at before had an ID here and it had a name here and it had a quantity. Here we don't have that. So this is what I mentioned. If you look right here, when you run the query, you get what's called a result set back. And that doesn't matter what database you're using. The result of a query is known as a result set. 
So notice what we have here. Let results of type FM result set question mark equals this. All right. Because if you've got a database and that database has fields that are in there that must be in there, you know, basically the stuff that's in there is required, and you leave it blank. So if I left this thing blank right here, I had nothing in there whatsoever, and I click find, not find, if I click save, I don't want the program to blow up. All right, and that's why we're using the question mark and the uh, exclamation point. Okay. Now, when we get this stuff back, when we, we get back that thing that we just looked at, that results, it's a result set. So what we can do, and this is what they show at the end of the chapter, is we can peruse our way through it. So while results next equal true, what that's going to do is it's going to keep going through every record until that's not true. When it's not true, it'll return end of file. So it's kind of called a look ahead or a peak function, P-E-E-K, all right, because it's looking at the next record, okay? And if it finds it, it's going to output, if we went into a loop like this, it would output for everybody, in this case, their address and their phone number. All right? So that's what they had you do in chapter 45. All right? Then came the fun part, chapter 46. All right, so in Chapter 46, they have you build the app. The app is not hard to build. You all can build this app that you see right here. And not only that, you all know looking at it, you're going to have to come over here, and you're going to have to set up what? All right? An IB outlet. An IB outlet. An IB outlet. And an IB outlet. Does that make sense? Okay? And he literally calls these name, address, phone, and he calls that status. All right? And then for here, and for here, you create an IB action. And I'm not sure, I, I think he just calls them save and find. I, I really don't remember. Okay? But that should make sense. And everybody, if I asked you to do that, I'm not. But if I asked you to do that, you could all do that in literally about a minute. All right? So he talks about that. That's all cool. So as he says, the focus of the chapter is to create a very simplistic app designed to store contact information, names, addresses, and phone numbers in an SQLite database. <clears throat> so he gets in here, creating and preparing for the project. He has you build it as a single view named database. Again, you'll have that, that it, it's already out there on the system. And then he talks about a few things here. Now, what he tells you is not right. It's either changed, okay, and it's changed, you know, I don't, I don't know why it's changed, but it's changed, okay? So what he tells you to do is this. I'm going to come in here just to show you this. I'm going to come into Xcode or try to come into Xcode. We'll do it like this. And again, I put all these steps in there too, just so you know. Okay? Hopefully you can tell if you look up on the screen. I did not go during the break and have somebody check out the Mac for me. All right. So I've already got database here, but so I'm just going to create another one. So I'm going to create a new Xcode project. You don't have to follow along. You don't have to do this. I've already got this on there for you. All right. Single view. He tells you to call it database, so I'll just call this one database2. 
He tells you to make it swift and universal. It really doesn't matter whether it's universal or iPhone. Next. All right, save it as always. I just saved it to the desktop. And now is where things will change a little bit from what is shown in the book. All right, in the book, the author says, once you get here and you have that screen that's showing up on screen right now, the author says to, that what you want to do is you want to add a couple libraries, or really the sqlite3.dileb. That's the first thing. It's not called that anymore. They don't have the DYLIB extensions on them anymore. The extension has changed to TBD. What does that stand for? I don't have a clue. I thought to be determined, but I, I really and truly don't know. All right. And how do I find that out? A lot of work on Stack Overflow to find out this and how to do it. All right. Because what they say is it says select the build phases tab, which is right there. Everybody see where my mouse is? And they say click there. And once you do that, all right, it says. Uh, find the link with libraries section. All right, link binary with libraries right there. Okay, and then they say click this plus sign. All right, and actually, when you do it like this, if you follow, don't follow their directions exactly, if you follow what I just showed you, it works fine. All right, so what we have to do when we come in here now, the author says. When you click the plus button, you'll get a full list. From this list, search for and then select lib sql 3 dilib and click add. Well, that's not the name of it anymore. All right. So again, the way that I found that out, and unfortunately it looks like I closed that window, but the way I found that out was to go on to Stack Overflow because I was having some problems with it. All right. So I went up here. And I wanted SQLite. And notice what's up here. I just typed in SQLite. And notice what it found. All right, it's very hard to see, but it's L, IOSQLite 3.0.tbd, and L, the same thing without the point zero. All right? And it didn't tell us in your book, it didn't say that there was any of this kind of stuff there. And it didn't say that one was 3 and one was 3.0, and which one do you... So I, you know, I could have probably loaded both of them. I just loaded the second one, the three. But again, it's dot tbd now. All right. So literally, what I wanted to do then was I wanted to highlight it, and then add will come up here when I do that. All right. Okay. But what they didn't tell you in the book was if I do this again, there is another one that you need. And I don't remember the name of it, but it's got a Z in it. That's all I remember. I think it's libz. I've got these all. Well, let me bring that up. Bring that up. All right, I'm 99.9% .9 sure it's libz.tbd, and you had to add that one too. Now, if you do that, you do it correctly. So again, I click plus. When all that stuff came up, all right, I typed in libz to get that one and sqlite3 to get that one. Click plus on both of those, all right? So what that's done is that basically is that links the binary. If you don't do that, what they'll tell you is the program will work until you try to run it because it needs those library files, all right? But it'll probably compile, but it won't run, okay? So that was the first thing. So again, they're TBD files. So the author says in order for to use the this FMDB, this wrapper, it says the source files for the wrapper needed to be added to the project. And like I said, this is just bizarre compared to the way that we did it for the uh, for Android. So what do I mean? Well, after we've done all this, then we can come up to source code and click checkout. Okay. 
okay? What we have to do is we have to tell the system to go out to GitHub, find the stuff we want, and copy it over to our machine. Does that make sense? Now, the bad news about that is if, if, if when you get onto the system with your machine, if it asks you if you want to connect to the Internet, if you've just blown that away and never done it, you have to connect to the Internet. Okay? So I went to checkout, and this is what comes up. All right? So down here, and again, this is right from your book, right from page, the top of page 328. I type in HTTPS colon slash slash github.com com slash cc gus slash fmdb.git all right so i put all that in make sure that it looks okay and click next now it's verifying the credentials so it's seeing whether or not i literally am hooked up to the internet and I'm, I'm in there basically as somebody, okay? All right, so now you've done this. This is the middle of page 328. So the author says, you click master, just master, and then you click next. All right? Okay, now they say check, choose a location. Where do you want to save all this stuff that you're copying? So what I said, it, it looks like it defaults to documents. I said I just want to save it to the desktop. Okay, does that make sense? All right. Then I click the download button. Now, see, it already exists because I did it this morning. Yours won't say that, but since I did it this morning, that's why it's saying. So it says it already exists. I'll just tell it to replace it. All right, and it's doing it. Now, I should have removed it, and I wish I would have this morning. The reason that I wish I would have, and I want to show you this, this is, again, I'm going to go back to the book just so you can see it. So we're in, the, in here doing the checkout, okay? That's what you saw the screen that came up. And then this kit, I'm jumping ahead, sorry. This is what's going to come up on your screen if you follow all those steps. It'll say, hey, just so you know, you're working with a library that's set up for Objective-C. You're not working with a library that's set up with Swift. Do you want the system to automatically, for you, create what's called a bridge to make sure the communication between Objective-C and Swift is as smooth as possible? So you click yes. I had that come up this morning. Okay. Do you remember, again, it's been a while since we've done this, I realize that, but do you remember during some time, I don't remember if it was the tip calculator or something else, we did something where we copied some stuff, some images into that XC assets folder, remember that? And when we did that, we copied stuff over, it asked if we wanted to copy it, okay? You get that message too, and you do want to copy it, because otherwise it tries to move it, you don't have the right to move it, so you say you do want it to. Now, once you do all that stuff, what's going to happen? And again, I've got the stuff there already, so I apologize for that. <clears throat> Is you're going to see this on the screen. Once you click that for those buttons, then you're going to you're going to you're going to click over here. You're going to get a brand new window that's going to come up. It's going to look like a new project. And in the upper left-hand corner, it's going to say FMDB, right there. There won't be anything else there. You won't see any of this stuff. But you'll see the, the, the arrow there. So if you click it, it'll expand it. So if you click that, it'll expand it. And if you click and expand source and you expand FMDB, these probably don't make any sense to you. But when you work with Objective-C, instead of using .swift files, you use .h files for your headers, like we did in the C language, and you use .m files for your implementation files. So what that is doing is it's saying, there, 
you, you click the first one and the last one, which highlights all of them, okay? Which says, hey, I want to take all those, and after you've done that and you've highlighted those, you take them and you drag them over to your other window, which has got the name of your project in it, and drop it right into that folder. And I'm making it maybe sound hard. It really and truly, I look at it this way. If I can do it, get it to work the first time, it ain't that friggin' hard. It worked just fine. So, the next thing that you do then is you come in and you build the interface. Oh, I'm sorry. When you do this, you have to open up one of the files. Okay? And it says there you want to open up a, a thing that says database bridging header.h, and you have to add literally one line in it. This is the most important line in your program. Because FMDB is it, that that is the uh, SQLite wrapper. The same dot H that says everything that's available in the file, make it available to my program. All right. Then you come in next and you design the interface. So they give you a page of that on page 329 in your book, and the author just says, again, when you do this, maybe mine isn't as pretty as what's in the book. But the author says, label, 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 text field, text field, text field, another label, and make that label be as wide as, you know, as, you know, so here's your, here's your name, your label, there's your text field, label, text field, label, text field. And he says, make that label as wide as the name of the text field together. And then underneath that, put two buttons. I already just mentioned to you about the outlets and the actions. So he tells you what he called everything on page 329 in the book. All right. Then the rest of the stuff that's in there, and I'm going to go through it, the rest of the stuff that's in there on 330, 331, 332, and 333 is almost completely code. All right. And I want to show you here, don't normally do it like this, but I'm going to anyway, so let's see. I'm going to close this. Of course, it wouldn't show it there. You know what I did this morning? I went and dragged it in and moved it from there to here. So you would have it. So now I gotta drag it back. I'm just gonna open it right from the flash drive just so you can see it. So I just want you to see this. Again, it's all in one file here, which is much nicer than what we just saw in the, um, in the Android. But what I did was we came all the way through here. There's your database path, so we had to add that variable. These I already showed you. That's for the name, the address, the phone number, and the status. All right. This is our save button that's right here. But if you look, what I'm trying to show you here is I tried to, between what they showed in the book and myself, I tried to put a lot of comments in there to explain to you what was happening all the time. So as it says, this method is responsible for saving contact data to the database. The method needs to open the database file, extract the text from the three text fields, and then construct and execute an SQL insert statement. 
So that's what's happening right here. Here is what happens if it fails. Here's what happens if it succeeds. All right. So with all the stuff that's in there, what I tried to do was walk you through it with comments to show you what was going on. All right. So that was the thing for doing a find, or I'm sorry, a save. Here was for a find. Again, you can see all the comments that I put in there. All right. Here was the view did load because you have to add code in there also. And I put comments in there. Plus, I added in here the UI text delegate and this to try to set it up so that when you clicked off of it, the keyboard would go away and the touches began and all that. I put that in there. That wasn't shown in the book. All right. But I put that in there also. And that's what you see down at the bottom here. So as you can see, it's, a, it's less than 200 lines for, again, a fairly simplistic relational database management system, which allows you to go both ways, which allows you to put in a name, click a Find button, and fill up everything that's in here from a database, or create new information in the text fields, click the Save button, and write it out to a database. All right? Questions? Was, I didn't know how long that would take, but and hopefully it made at least some sense to you. Now, if, if you want to, in either this class or the Android class, try to do something with databases, feel free. But you don't have to. All right? It's whatever makes the most sense to you. Remember, we also went through an example of using the user defaults. All right, so if what you're saving isn't much and you want to save it out that way, that's fine. If you want to save it to a file, you can do that if you need to save things. All right, but just like the other class, and I'm not going to bring it up because I don't have it on here, but just like with the other class, you know, you don't have to, but if you turn that piece of paper over I gave you earlier, it looks the same as the one for Android. All right, so this Thursday I'm going to talk, and I'm going to talk about... Um, Core data on Thursday, all right? And walk you through the same example, but done with core data rather than doing it with um, SQLite. And I'm going to you know, go back and look at my code, and if I see any errors or anything, I'll put an updated copy out there. But then after this week, so Thursday it'll be a lab in the morning class. It'll be a lab in Android and I will lecture on core data in this class, all right? Now, hopefully you all realize this week, next week, and the following week, I'm giving you three weeks of lab time for the dip for your last dip assignment, all right? Then, on it's like April 11th or something like that, which is about three weeks from today, we're going to go over some Angular stuff. And Angular can be used to do a lot of things. It can do a lot of cool things. And I don't know if I'm going to have the time, the patience, or the ability, but what, what my hope was, was we go over the Angular stuff. Then, if you don't really know what, one of the reasons that Angular is used so much, not the only reason, but one of the reasons that Angular is used so much is to create what are called SPAs. Now, I said, how many of you know what an SPA is? I don't know if anybody, I don't know if John knows, I don't know if anybody in here would raise their hand. It's a single page application. All right? And the idea is this. You know, it comes up right now, you've got your, you know, for your Uber thing, you've got some kind of a main page. All right? And then you've got links in there for about, contact, etc. But the idea with a, with a single page app is you might have, just like we have, you know, maybe the same, you've got the same header and the same footer on all pages, all right? But what happens is, if I go from my home page to my about page, if I look up in my address bar, nothing changes except the thing at the end. And I don't mean that it's, it's a new file. What it does is it uses Ajax to only reload the part of the page that needs to be reloaded, all right? That's one of the cool things about Angular. I'm in the middle of watching a whole bunch of things online. 
I'm taking a class, which isn't very good, on Angular, but I will have something for you. I will tell you that the way the author of our book explains it is really, really, really confusing. All right, if you haven't read it so far. So I'm probably not going to do very much from the book in chapters 20 through 29. I'd like us, my hope is that we'll, we'll spend some time and we'll create a few simple examples so you can at least say you've been exposed to Angular. All right, that's the hope. All right. So again, lab Thursday in the first two classes and core data in this class. And I'll try to upgrade this, make sure it's all working, and I'll put it out there as soon as I possibly can.